Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Ewan Kennedy from, the New, from New Zealand's Department of Conservation. Um, welcome to the first of two sessions on rat and murine matters, mouse matters. Um, the uh, second follows immediately after morning tea. Um, you haven't come here to listen to me. I'm not going to give you a whole lot of flim flam. Let's just get straight into it. We've got five speakers this morning. A session traversing interesting questions from the future, past, present and future rather. Um, and first up I'd like to welcome Greg Howard again to the microphone. Did a grand job yesterday afternoon <laughs> covering for someone else. Um, Greg works um, for the very talented team in Ireland Conservation. Um, he's fortunate enough to be based in British Columbia, Canada. A view of the future. Thank you. <clears throat> so I was given a request to uh, give an overview of kind of where in the context of rat and mouse eradications, where we've been and where we're going uh, in keeping with the theme of scaling up to meet the challenge, uh, the theme of the conference here. Rat and mouse eradication is a proven conservation tool. It's been used in all the world's oceans, but we're not yet matching uh, the scale of the problem. In other words, our efforts are not yet matching the scale and scope of the problem that we're seeing around the world. We're starting to hit the upper limits of our tools and techniques. Do we have, it's on my screen, I don't know about you guys. How's this? Thank you very much. Greg, can I just... Um, yeah, sorry, you're chewing them until my time. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Do we have a Bolton or a Horton in here, please? There are two speakers missing from the session downstairs. I see no sign. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Greg. Yeah. Um, and so I gave it some thought, and uh, it's taking our incremental approach that we have in the past, it's really is, incrementalism has really gotten us this far, but now what? Um, just for definition here, what we're meaning by incrementalism, uh, Wikipedia will tell you it's working by using many small incremental stepwise changes instead of fewer transformative large jumps. It's an extremely important way, it's, it's how we learn, but is it enough? Uh, again, my name is Greg Howald. I work with Island Conservation. It's an NGO headquartered in California. I'm based in Canada and British Columbia. Um, our mission is to prevent extinctions by removing invasive species from islands. Um, I've been with the organization for over 19 years. I've been in the field of uh, island conservation uh, since 1994. I had the, for me, the extreme privilege and honor to work with one of the New Zealand's uh, historical, uh, I guess you could say fathers of this type of conservation, Raleigh Taylor, that did a lot of work, the groundwork uh, for, for New Zealand's uh, recent 50 year celebration of rat eradication, setting the foundation for their work. Uh, I've had the privilege to work, um, one of my watershed projects for, for island conservation work in North America on Anacapa Island in California, really brought some of the tools and the techniques that have been uh, mainstreamed in, in New Zealand, brought it over to North America uh, on Anacapa. Um, so just to give you an overview of what we're going to look at, um, it's basically again where we've been and where we're going. We're looking, going to look at some of the opportunities and the challenges that we're facing. Uh, looking at that we're well beyond the proof of concept. It's not really about whether or not we can take rats off islands, um, but the question is, are we making a dent into the biodiversity? Are we having a very positive impact to the scale that we think we could be? Um, and although our incremental approach is really a fundamental to how we as people learn, it's essential, but in reality it's insufficient for what we're trying to achieve. And if it's insufficient, now what's next? Well, we know that, that uh, removing invasive species, particularly introduced rats and mice from islands, is a huge conservation challenge, and it's an opportunity. We know that islands represent about 5% of the Earth's land mass and support a disproportionate amount of the world's biodiversity. About 20% of all bird, reptile, and plant species can be found on islands on these tiny parcels of land. Historically, we've seen about two-thirds, uh, upwards of 80% have been some of the estimates of extinctions since 1500, since they've been documented. And today, islands are supporting upwards of 40% uh, of all uh, threatened or critically endangered species. And we know that an introduced species have been implicated uh, in most of these vertebrate extinctions. And one of the, arguably one of the worst of the invasives on these islands uh, are introduced rats and mice and they're having direct and indirect uh, impacts in these ecosystems. 
that not only affect our biodiversity, but also affects the people uh, as well. Looking at uh, taking a step back, looking at introduce, taking a look at the big picture here, here's a global map. Look, we're talking about the four commensal species, the radis, the three radis, and the mus. Uh, I'm not going to talk about any others, that's the main focus. One, another cornerstone paper by Ian Atkinson, uh, published in 1985, took a look at the historical distribution of rodents, um, taking a look at the pathway uh, movement around the island, to the island, around the world to the various islands. Um, these species evolved on, in Southeast Asia, and they moved onto the islands first through the Silk Trade Route uh, thousands of years ago, likely into European islands, the Mediterranean islands, uh, and the near shore European islands. Um, and then about 2,500 years ago, uh, the Polynesians started moving out of, out of Southeast Asia into Malay region, into the Pacific, uh, sometimes deliberately carrying rats and introducing them onto the islands, and eventually making it to Hawaii, uh, arriving around 1,300 based on the paleoecological record. And then, of course, uh, during around the 14, 1500s, the Europeans started moving around, uh, again, transporting introduce, and introducing rodents to islands around the world. And today, the estimates are upwards of over 80% of the world's islands or island archipelagos have introduced uh, rats and or mice. So it's a huge problem. And today, what we're seeing uh, is still an implication uh, for some of our species uh, on these islands. We're still seeing introductions that are happening. This is uh, the Great Circle Route, uh, movement of transport of goods between Asia and North America. They uh, transport up through the North Pacific, they cross through, bisect the, the Aleutian Islands, and come back down uh, into North America and vice versa. A lot of ship traffic going up into that region. And what we see every year, there are incidents. Uh, there are shipwrecks and fishing vessels that run aground uh, across the various Aleutian Islands that have the potential and or uh, they do carry introduced roads to the islands. Just as a point of reference here, this is actually one ship. That's the bow section of this ship here. Uh, that ran, ran aground off on Alaska there, and this is a fishing vessel uh, that ran aground. It's so significant that the state of Alaska, in conjunction with the Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, have come together and uh, are trying to um, prevent these introductions and also created laws to prevent uh, fishing vessels that come ashore on some of their islands in, in the Aleutians and elsewhere from bringing introduced rats to the island. Biosecurity Protecting those, protecting those islands is an extremely important uh, aspect of the work that they're doing, uh, what we're all doing, uh, protecting the investment of our eradications that we make is a critical aspect of our work. So removing invasive rats and mice from islands, we're well beyond the proof of concept. We know that we can remove them. We know based on a, a look at the, uh, the database on island invasive species, um, eradications. We know that introduced rats and mice have been coming off islands, but islands greater than five hectares, there's really only three uh, fundamental approaches that are being used, and it's the delivery of bait uh, containing a rodenticide placed into every potential territory across the entire landscape. In the cases of larger islands or islands with steep cliffs where we can't put people on, placing bait stations using aerial broadcast, for example, or very large islands, hand broadcast the distribution of bait uh, using uh, spreading bait by hand, or the methods that uh, Biz Bell talked about yesterday with the, with the bait stations laid out on a grid pattern, as you can see in the uh, graphic of, the, of an island, each dot representing a bait station. And just taking a look again at the database, just a cross-section of what we're doing up to date. Um, we're seeing, uh, out of all the attempts that, we've, that have been done, 28% uh, uh, have been using aerial broadcast technique uh, versus bait station uh, technique is about 45 percent. Roughly they're equal. Broadcast versus broadcast clearly as a, as a collective aerial in hand is, is uh, used more or less equally to, to bait station techniques. Um, but what's interesting, these numbers from aerial to bait station were inverse about three years ago. There seems to be a resurgent, as Biz was talking about yesterday, uh, bait station uh, use over actually the last few years. However, Take a look at the total land area that's being treated, uh, aerial versus uh, bait station. We're seeing about a five, five times increase in aerial broad using aerial broadcast approach. So taking a look at where this work is done, uh, each dot represents uh, sort of a center point. How this data or this map was generated, uh, there's a dot placed on the map where the, the islands are located in a thousand kilometer perimeter. 
Um, what this tells us is that it's happening in all the world's oceans. Uh, rodent eradications are happening around the world. Um, the bigger the dot represents the bigger number of eradications that have been documented in the region. We're seeing, of course, New Zealand, who has truly mainstreamed uh, this type of conservation action. Uh, they celebrated a 50-year uh, investment into, into rodent eradications uh, in New Zealand in the last couple of years. Um, after that comes Australia. And we're seeing some very interesting work happening in, in the Mediterranean. The Italians uh, are doing some great work, a number of islands in, off their coast. Um, the Japanese and the Ogasawara Islands uh, are really starting to get into it. Um, off the coast of Argentina, there's some significant work in the Falklands, up in the Caribbean. It's a global effort. So the quick stats. Uh, globally, we've seen about 732 uh, rodent eradication attempts on about 541 islands in total. Um, Radis represent the dominant number, about 650 on 527 islands. Uh, collectively, we're seeing about a 90% uh, success, 89% success rate is being reported. I have a question mark from us. There is a there is a data we could crunch a number, but there is kind of a question mark uh, around mus musculus and and the and the success rate around that. There's a lot of uh, historical discussion around that in some of the literature. Um, and I think, Keith, you're going to be uh, up next, plug for your talk next, so stick around for Keith's talk, talking a little bit about some of the MUS issues. Just taking a look at a scatter plot of the, of the successful and in-progress in progress rodent eradications. 1951 was the first documented, probably accidental, uh, rat eradication. And over time, we're seeing uh, more of an acceleration of this type of work. Uh, particularly after um, after 2001, with the meeting in New the first meeting in New Zealand, we really started picking up the pace. However, our median the line represents the median, so 50% of the islands above, 50% below, um, is roughly the size is roughly about 13 hectares. So half the islands that have been done are greater than 13 hectares, and half are less than 13 hectares. Not significant land area, but that number is likely to increase. As we're seeing, on average, uh, the mean area cleared of rodents per year is definitely increased. We're seeing a spike, of course, in 2011, which uh, represents, I believe, Macquarie. Uh, the success on Macquarie is, is really contributing to that. Uh, South Georgia is not on here, uh, deliberately, because it's not yet uh, successful, successfully declared, or declared success just yet. And we know that introduced species have a great impact. Rats and mice have an impact on these islands. We're looking for a conservation return. It's not about the rat eradication. It's not about the mouse eradication. It's about the conservation return that comes from the execution of that activity. In this paper that uh, Holly Jones, Nick Holmes, that all uh, reported in 2016, looking at the be benefits of overall mammal eradications from islands, documenting 596 populations uh, of 236 species on 181 islands have demonst demonstrated benefit from these eradication attempts. And again, it's a global, we're seeing benefits on a global scale in all the world's oceans. And for me, uh, just kind of coming back to Anacapa, uh, making it on an island scale, and I know for those of you who've done rodent eradications uh, and you're documenting these ecological changes, uh, you each have your own stories. And for me, this is a 14% year-over-year return benefiting the Scripps's murrelet, a small uh, palm, this bird will fit in the, in the palm of your hand. Um, the adult birds will fit in the palm of your hand. We're seeing a 14% year-over-year year return uh, on, this, uh, on this project, including an ashy storm petrel, a threatened species off the coast of California. So it's a powerful, powerful conservation tool, and it's something to sell. This 14% year-over-year return, it's a return on investment, it's paying dividends, and the island and the projects are continuing to pay dividends that we can sell and push forward for the next project. And sometimes, every once in a while, we get an insight well beyond the biodiversity. We are a biodiversity conservation organization. Many of you are focused on the biodiversity. But every once in a while, and we heard it yesterday in some of the talks, that there is a benefit beyond the biodiversity. Uh, a project that we worked on on the, on the Aleutian Islands, on Rat Island. We got an insight into that about two years after the island was declared rat free. The local uh, indigenous community decided, they rallied and decided and officially petitioned the government to change the name, which was Rat Island, uh, and historically restored or historically reclaimed their island 
which is now known as Hawada, which is defined as those two over there. So if incrementalism has got us this far, the question is, are we making a dent? Yes, we're making a dent on some projects, but here's the stats on a metal level. Here's our reach. There's 180,000 islands. If we just do the simple math, 80% of the world's islands have introduced rodents. Only 0.3% of all the world's islands uh, uh, have been treated. Um, the feasible tools and technology that we have, our capacity that we're using, we can only reach about 15% of those islands that have threatened species, species that are threatened by introduced rodents on islands. We're starting to hit the upper limits of our tools, our capacity, both in terms of island size, in terms of numbers, and also the biological complexity. It's getting harder. We want to reach these threatened species. We want to do bigger islands. We want to have bigger benefits from a biodiversity perspective, looking at social economic and other perspectives on this, on this type of work. But we're starting to reach the limits of that technology. We know that incrementalism, again, it's, it's the way we learn. It's the way stepwise. Success begets success. Um, but it's not sufficient to reach where we're trying to get to. So the question is, how do we break through this incrementalism barrier? We know that eradications are more than just the logistics and tactics. We know that these scale linearly. You know that you increase your island size, you have to put that much more bait out, that much more flying time with a helicopter, that much more investment on the ground. Per hectare costs, for all intents and purposes, from the logistic tactical perspective, increases linearly. But we know that there's other factors to consider. It's ecological risk, there's legal regulatory parameters, social political angles, some ethical issues. Where I come from in the work that we're doing, particularly in North America, we're in a chronic discussion over ethics around this type of work and financial aspects, of course. And we know that the challenges and the risks that are coming, they're growing faster as we scale up. It's not just about the logistics and tactics. It's not just about taking the rats off the islands. It's a much bigger picture. These other elements are increasing faster as we scale up that need to be accounted for. So I'm an ecotoxicologist by training. That's my background. This is how I got into this work. I, I'm going to walk you through a case study looking at why and how these uh, incrementalism and the challenges that we're facing using the rodenticides <coughs> as a perspective. We know how we're using them. Again, this is a subset uh, of the data. Overall, 89% of the projects that, are, that are, uh, have been done have used the second generation anticoagulant uh, rodenticide known as Berdificum and also the first generation dominate. There's other, a few others that have used other rodenticides, but the vast majority, in fact, you could say all of them, uh, have used strictly the uh, anticoagulant rodenticides. We know, that they're, we know that they're not species specific. We know that they do work, particularly the second generation anticoagulants. They're very toxic to the rodents. The reason we choose it is it, it works. However, it comes with the risk. It comes with some trade-offs that comes with it. It is a broad spectrum uh, vertebrate toxicant. It can impact other species. And so we take these and use these in the context of evaluating where's the risk versus the benefit. As long as we don't have a population level impact, we typically move forward. It's typically the framework for our decisions. And so taking a look and using Berdificum, we know because this is a one-time application, after the application, bait goes on the ground, rats are removed, mice are removed from the island, rodenticide breaks down over time, and we end up with carbon dioxide and water, and the island is a happy place. We know that when we introduced we introduce rodenticides into the island. We want, typically what we see is a penetration of the, the residues into the, into the ecosystem. In some sense, we kind of want that. Uh, it's a deliberate intent to the, introduce this pesticide into the environment. We're targeting these rodents on these islands. What happens, you see a spike into the ecosystem. It has this, what, this biphasic decline over time. As long as we're not putting more in, it does, again, decline over time. The question is, how long does this timeline last? That's the question. And for me, as an ecotoxicologist, this represents uh, some of the uncertainty. And for me, that's what keeps me up at night. We know that these chemicals can persist in the ecosystem in different compartments, depending on where it goes. We know it can be recycled. And it can and does have implication for species, other species on the island, 
over time. And it can be significant, particularly when we're working on islands with endemic species that are at risk from the non-target, as a non-target species. And just as an example, on that timeline, this is from the island of Pinzone in the Galapagos. Uh, rats were removed, benefiting uh, a number of species, including the Pinzone giant tortoise, uh, which is now breeding successfully the first time in the wild. However, the introduction of Bridificum onto the island, uh, for some reason, we're not quite clear, but there's new data showing that the reptiles, particularly the lava lizards, have been have ingested and are picking up uh, 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 the Bridificum residues, and is persisting much longer in this, uh, in this uh, food chain, much longer than we anticipated. And as a consequence, as a consequence we have to, had to hold on to uh, the resident hawk population, we mitigated for that population, but as a consequence of this long-term persistence of rodenticide in the prey base of the hawk, we had to hold these hawks in captivity much longer. This can have implications for other species. We weren't anticipating to hold on to those hawks for that long, but we had to because of the persistence of the rodenticide uh, in that population of lizards. And it can have implications beyond. We know that rodenticides have a tendency to move around. This is a simple food web from the island of, of Rat Island or Hawada, uh, looking at what happened up there with regards to non-target take. We're targeting rats on the island. It's hard to deliver bait to the rats on the island without also making it available to other species. This simple upfront a priori uh, risk assessment is our only tool, and sometimes we don't get it perfectly right. And when we move on to other islands, much, much larger islands, much more complex, we get into islands that have people. When we add people into the equation, not only are they presenting uh, a challenge for how do you deliver bait, in this case, uh, rodents, ma rice, mice, and rats on the island of Floriana, they present uh, an efficacy risk. We have to change the way or do additional work on how we're delivering bait to all the, the rodents on the islands, but the people themselves the community themselves, the, the people, the domestic animals, the children that are on the island, they present as a non-target species themselves and we have to manage for it. And so our investment into upfront risk assessment goes way up. This is a, uh, just a demonstration of a, of a risk assessment, uh, ecological risk assessment looking at both primary exposure pathways, uh, species that might ingest the bait, and the secondary exposure pathways uh, looking at what might transfer up through the food web with a consideration of, in the top left corner there, uh, of, of people. And this can get pretty messy, pretty complex, requiring much more detailed planning, much more, um, much more uh, uh, investment in terms of communication with the people to understand and accept the risks and effectively develop and in implement mitigation measures to prevent that uh, food way and food web transfer. So what does this mean for us as we go up in complexity? This is the Farallon Islands off the, off the coast of California. We know that the, uh, as pesticides, we t you heard some yesterday about the legal conditions, the legal constraints. Globally, the anticoagulant rodenticides are being, uh, are being uh, targeted for restriction. We know that they're slowly being removed from the public hands. We're losing access to our tools over time. We're looking, uh, organization, other organizations are trying to ban them because of the concerns that we just outlined on our islands that we accept willingly going into these projects because of the long-term benefit in a mainland system. Uh, it's not as acceptable and the regulatory agencies are starting to restrict them. And we're starting to see some of the challenges associated with uh, this type of work uh, coming uh, more of a, a, a animal welfare and controversy can erupt with this. And we're seeing in some circumstances that, that even in extreme cases that uh, arguments around these projects and the ethics of these projects can be complicated to work through, including uh, as extreme cases that rats have rights. But more so the conversation is shifting towards animal welfare. There is an animal welfare community that is starting to emerge. They're scientifically based, actually they're coming out of New Zealand, uh, a lot of them. Uh, and they're doing some pretty good work and they're starting to look at our work and the work that we're doing, and which creates a much more complicated environment for us to work in. As a consequence, our timelines go up, our communications go up, which increases costs, which leads to, uh, at times, frustration, some fatigue, uh, and sometimes failure over time. Uh, 
it, at best what this does is it challenges some of the, it challenges our, our decision makers, their measure of cost benefit. We're looking at it from a biological perspective. Decision makers not only take a look at the cost benefit from a biological perspective, but they're taking a full look at the picture. Again, the ethics, the financial, uh, in addition to the logistics as well. So now what? <clears throat> We know that incrementalism, if we want to go bigger, taking the approach that we've been taking historically won't get us there. What are we going to do? Well, first of all, we know that incremental is essential, uh, but we need to keep doing what we're doing. Where it is feasible, our current approach, our approach, the tools, the techniques that we're doing, we need to keep doing what we're doing. We need to accelerate uh, the pace, the scale of the type of projects that we're doing, wherever they're feasible. In addition, we need to look at how not only implementing, but we need to catalyze others to do this type of work, and we need to inspire others to do this type of work. We need to maintain our due diligence. We just highlighted some of the challenges that we're facing. Um, we're re in essence, it's really about protecting the tool. We need to protect the tool so that we all have access to it to be able to continue on. And we need to keep going and step it up in a big way. Just to give you a couple <laughs> examples, Size and scale does matter. We have uh, South Georgia as an example of some of the great work that's already started. Macquarie, the great success we're seeing on, on Macquarie. And some of the scaling, the efficiencies that we're gaining as an example is on a, on a project that was uh, an international cooperation sharing uh, resources on Palmyra Henderson and Phoenix Islands. And we're looking at some of the bigger islands that are just on the horizon here or just in our, in our field of view on this side of the horizon line on islands of Mexico, Gough, Marion, in the Indian Ocean, we've got Floriana on the, on the horizon right now, Lord Howe, and the Juan Fernandez is an example. And there are many other islands out there that I may not be aware of uh, at this point, but they're out there and they're coming. Just to give you an idea of some, some uh, uh, efficiency, this is the, the vessel Aquila um, that was shared between uh, the RSPB, some folks out of New Zealand, and uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service and Island Conservation did a joint cooperative project where resources literally came from across the Pacific. Bait coming out of New Zealand that was used in the Phoenix Islands and Henderson, bait that came from Madison, Wisconsin, from Bell Labs, uh, transported to Palmyra helicopters, and the ship out of Seattle and Alaska. And they all converged in the Central Pacific, and the teams moved on and off the islands depending on the project that they were working on, but the central uh, cost efficiency was through cost sharing of the vessel and the helicopters that were on board. But in addition to that, efficiencies, we need to look at what's, what else can we be doing. There's a paper that uh, Carl, uh, how are we doing for time? Yeah. Um, Carl Campbell, who's here, uh, you're going to be giving a talk uh, a little later looking at some of the horizon scanning. We need to look at these efficiencies. We need to overcome these hurdles, dealing with these animal welfare issues, looking at move, improving the species specificity so that we can move onto these islands with endemic species and increase these feasibility on these much larger islands. And some of the technologies that are emerging, and I think you're talking a little bit more about this coming up in the fifth talk, um, is looking at basically this, you've, you've heard some of this genetically modified uh, this CRISPR technology, looking at some of the genetic work that has the potential to really, in this Audubon article, could one day save island birds. There's a, a pr partnership that's, that's emerged out of this that's looking at uh, development of a, of a mouse construct. Uh, it's called the Genetic Biocontrol of Invasive Rodent Program. It's multiple international partners, and that's all I'm gonna say about it, but there is a number of talks that's gonna be here that has the potential, uh, it, the new research, the potential to solve a lot of our issues that we're looking at. We need to engage in some of the, the ethics around uh, the conservation work that we're doing. Again, the animal welfare community is becoming a science base. They are coming forward. They do have valid arguments. And they're really lying. It's not that they deny the work that we're doing. They're not a, a value-based organization. Uh, not wanting us to pursue the work. They understand the work that we're trying to do. What they want us to do is move us towards choosing methods that should predictably minimize harm to animal welfare. We need to engage. We need to ramp up our partnerships that we're working together on. We're already working. There's some global efforts, the Global Island Partnership, Honolulu Challenge, where I'm working under the North America Trilateral Island Initiative. There's work in the Mediterranean, in the Pacific, through SPREP. The ICN is working. Um, 
we need to be working together more on this work. We need to establish more pri private public partnerships such as Bell Labs, uh, who's here at the meeting today, that really have, as a, as a vendor, providing the, the bait products that we use, but really working with the community to develop the tools, the right tools that we need to better implement our projects and maximize our success. We need to elevate our voices around the, around the world. And we need to leverage these global partnerships strengthen the linkages between our partnerships to unlock new resources. The work that we're doing is relevant beyond the biodiversity. We're relevant to agriculture, we're relevant to human health and welfare, uh, we're relevant to the communities. There was some talk around the ecotourism aspects as well. Our projects are getting much more bigger, they're getting more complex, they're getting much, much more expensive. We need to somehow unlock those new resources. We need to work together. Oh. So just in moving to conclusion here, uh, New Zealand, you heard a little bit about the predator-free New Zealand uh, work that's been started. It's really New Zealand's uh, conservation moonshot. They've mainstreamed this island conservation initiative uh, where people are doing their own work. There's communities that are doing work on islands and they're basically run out of, running out of islands to do and the community is looking to see what's next. And they've adopted this predator-free New Zealand, which is really, again, a conservation moonshot but it's New Zealand's conservation moonshot. It is a reflection of the work that's been done over the last 50 years. They've really elevated uh, the bar here, and it's looking, uh, it's really not meant to be implemented tomorrow. Some of you are probably thinking, this is just a pie in the sky smoke. It's not meant, it's not meant to be a, uh, I'm out of time, huh? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's not meant to be a, uh, it's not meant to be implemented tomorrow. So just, just, in, uh, just, to, just to end here, is what i like to encourage is that uh, even though New Zealand's got this, we as a community have an opportunity. What is our moonshot? Thank you, Greg. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> a, a, a very refreshing consideration of um, progress. Um, next up, we have uh, my colleague, um, in Doc Keith Broom. Keith will be familiar to most of you, or to many of you rather. Oh, <laughs> I'll just wait a minute. Um, incidentally, when you come in late, please don't pass in front of the speaker. It's really disrespectful. Yeah, I'm nervous enough as it is. <laughs> um, that's the first time I've heard him say that. Um, Keith um, uh, uh, may have worked with many of you in the past. He chairs the Island Eradication Advisory Group at home. This is a, a, a group of curmudgeonly um, eradication veterans who um, critique eradication proposals. Happy to look at yours, I'm sure. Um, but they, they can give you really good advice on um, what you propose to do, and it'll be fairly forthright, Keith. Okay, thanks, Ewan. Tēnā uh, koutou katoa. Um, this paper has uh, got a cast of thousands, as you can see. Uh, if you're looking at my abstract, um, apologies to Richard, you, you dropped off there, uh, mate, but Richard made a, a good contribution to the paper, as did everyone else. What we want to do is uh, give you a bit of a picture of where things are at um, from a New Zealand perspective uh, with respect to the house mouse. And to do that, I'll, um, I'll look at these three questions. Um, what do we know about the impacts of mice in the New Zealand island ecosystems? Uh, and to meet my time frame, I'll be brutally um, succinct there. Uh, secondly, what have we learned about eradicating mice from New Zealand and what do we now consider best practice? Uh, and thirdly, what have we learned about preventing mice from reaching and, and establishing new populations on islands? And I want to illustrate uh, many of these things by telling you the story of Maud Island, which is a, a tale of woe uh, followed by uh, hope, uh, followed by intense worry uh, before ending happily. Um, we're not sure about the ever after but yet. So moving on to impacts and uh, 
mouse impacts in New Zealand are, are quite often confounded by rats uh, that are operating on the same site. Um, so in the few instances where we can study mice as the, um, the sole rodent species at a, at a site or an island, we find most of the impacts that uh, we would expect. They can have, uh, uh, be important seed destroyers uh, and uh, to the point of influencing uh, forest composition. Uh, they have profound effects on our uh, invertebrate and lizard fauna and uh, New Zealand has uh, on a world scale quite a distinctive uh, invertebrate and lizard fauna. Um, and they can attack uh, particularly small um, birds. So far we haven't seen the uh, damage to larger seabirds that uh, have been documented on, on uh, Gough and Marion, but to be fair we haven't done a lot of looking there either. For some years uh, now the Island Eradication Advisory Group has maintained a best practice document for rat eradication and mice we weren't so sure about um, and there was a worldwide review by uh, Jamie Mackay and others in 2007 which kind of reinforced these doubts by finding a higher failure rate uh, among mouse eradication projects. Uh, the reason for these failures were not readily discernible by the authors and so they recommended that uh, future projects reach a standard of excellence in planning and delivery um, so that uh, future analyses might tease out the um, other reasons for failure. So we decided to put a bit of stake in the ground for mouse eradication projects that we advised on and uh, came up with a variation of the uh, rat eradication best practice to test on mice eradications. And there are three basic changes to the rat one. Um, firstly, at, at least two uh, applications of Bridificum baits um, and each one using navigational guidance and uh, overlapping the baiting swaths by 50%. And if you don't know what I mean by that, the helicopter uh, goes one way, comes back and uh, a half overlap on the way so that every piece of uh, territory in theory has um, two passes of the um, baiting um, on each of the two applications or more. Another thing we did was to keep the flow rate uh, of baits higher um, through the bucket to be certain that it wasn't going to uh, block up in the, in the bucket and to provide plenty of bait for uh, uh, each time to cope with uh, the smaller home ranges of mice. And we also wanted to ensure that there was a, a good interval of, um, uh, between the two applications so that mice have um, plenty of time to access the bait and um, the toxicant by our other means as, as Greg has just um, illustrated. And we've um, recently uh, published this uh, mouse eradication best practice on our uh, website. Unfortunately, it's buried under 100 clicks on our website, so I suggest if you want to take a look at it, just go to the DOC website and use the search function and put in that phrase, eradication current agreed best practice. It'll get you there um, much more readily. So looking at our uh, track record of using this recipe, We've done 12 islands uh, over eight projects and Touchwood with 100% success. I say that because Antipodes remains to be confirmed. Um, and this has given us over 8,000 uh, hectares of uh, uh, island real estate cleared of mice. And if we hop the fence into Australian territory, we could add Macquarie uh, Island into that with another 12,800. Um, I just want to introduce you to, to Maud Island here in the uh, Marlborough Sounds, which is the top of the South Island, and at just over 300 hectares, um, surprisingly the island has never had a history of rodents. 
uh, Stokes and Wecker occasionally uh, swim to the, the island from the mainland, about 900 metres. And so there are measures in place to um, detect and eliminate uh, them when this occurs. A bit of a view of the island. Um, among the many uh, high value conservation um, native species is this critter, the endemic Maud Island frog. Um, something that we've got to focus on protecting from, the, um, from predators reaching the island. Uh, but also uh, uh, chytrid fungus, which is uh, uh, linked to the extinction of uh, amphibians worldwide. And so uh, there's a, uh, the island's um, closed to the general public and it has year-round uh, range of presence. And when you land on the island, you get to disinfect your boots. In October 2013, uh, a visiting researcher found a mouse in the accommodation unit and chased around and caught it, alerted the ranger, and an incursion response was initiated uh, with uh, various detection devices, including a rodent detection dog. Within a, a couple of days, the story looked very grim. Uh, several mice trapped. Uh, the dog uh, giving indications in severally uh, widely dispersed places over the island. Um, and uh, autopsy on the trapped animals suggests that they had uh, been there a few months and they would actually bred uh, over the New Zealand winter, which is unusual. So we decided that we had to uh, plan a, a whole, whole island eradication as soon as we could, but still adhering to our best practice. And it was going to be touch and go whether we could succeed um, against ex an expanding population of mice, but we didn't really want to wait for the, the, the full tragedy of uh, uh, the invasion to, to play out before doing anything. Um, in the meantime, we had a, a good look at um, what went wrong, to allow mice to uh, reach the island in the first place and to remain undetected for several months. And what we found was uh, some complacency around our quarantine standards. Uh, and mice were somewhat overlooked as a risk. Uh, there was a focus on chytrid, there was a focus on those other critters. Um, and so uh, in 2014, uh, we had uh, corrected those biosecurity failures and had robustly planned uh, mouse eradication to best practice standards. That's two applications of eight kilograms per hectare, which uh, ended up being applied uh, 23 days apart. Uh, because of our newfound vigour for mouse biosecurity surveillance uh, and coupled with our nervousness about uh, the chances of success in an expanding uh, population, we had a few mouse traps um, in operation over the island during the operation. And these turned up uh, two mice a few days after the second operation, so about a month after the first baiting. Uh, and then uh, two more um, in late September, fully 60 days after the first exposure to bait. Um, uh, these critters had brodificum residues in them, so they'd eaten the bait. Uh, not enough to kill them, obviously. And um, the uh, final one that was caught was uh, old enough to have been um, out of the nest at the time of baiting. Um, so desp despite a quite a bit of trapping thereafter, no more were caught, and to this day, um, more remains mouse-free. So what did we learn? Um, first and foremost... No matter how busy or important you think you are, biosecurity standards must apply um, to everyone without exception, and surveillance needs to be given priority over other tasks for island rangers. We need to identify the pathways and put in place multiple layers of protection so that failure or weakness in one layer will not be catastrophic to the protection of the island. Uh, reviewing independent review of procedures and practices is a good thing. 
uh, fresh eyes can see things that regulars are, are blind to. And the vulnerability of an island to mice can change um, between islands and it can change on an island over time. So just because you uh, haven't had mice before doesn't mean that you won't get them in the future. <coughs> Eradication lessons. Well, it can be eradicated from islands uh, even before they reach carrying capacity. Uh, if you give it your best shot, use plenty of bait, aim to keep it on the ground available for as long as you can. Mice behave differently in the presence of rats so that you don't always know that they're there. So if in doubt, um, design your rat eradication um, as if they were there. And he's looking at me, so I'll go quick. <laughs> Impacts. Mice are bad. <laughs> eradication, yes we can. And uh, they're a biosecurity threat to all islands. Thanks. Thank you, Keith. <clears throat> Well done. I'm very reluctant to stop you because you could be doing the same thing to me on Thursday. <laughs> Next up we have um, Richard Griffiths, uh, an, another member of the Island Invasives team. Um, I, won't, I don't need to say anything more. You, you just go for it. Yep. Can everyone hear me? Is that on? Great. Um, as Ewan said, my name is Richard Griffiths and I work for, also work for Island Conservation. I think uh, Tony described us yesterday as a, as a family and we certainly consider ourselves part of that. When you said that, Tony, I did think though that uh, to have more influence on the world stage, perhaps we should describe ourselves as a mafia rather than a family. Uh, today, I'll be sharing some thoughts on some of the factors that affect, are affecting success on tropical islands as they relate to rat and rodent eradications there. My ulterior motive, and I always have one of these, is to, to get you so intrigued and excited about rodent eradications on tropical islands that you immediately uh, join us in, in trying to answer many of the questions that face us. I know I risk offending those working on more te temperate locations, including myself, but if you're in the business of biodiversity conservation, you need to be working on tropical islands. That's where you'll have the greatest impact for biodiversity. In 2012, uh, this community got a bit of a wake-up call when several high profile projects on tropical islands failed. This triggered a, a review of current practices and a lot of people here, some of the, uh, a lot of people, some of whom are in this room, got together to understand why existing methods were not having the same level of success on tropical islands. The review confirmed our suspicion that the, the rate of failure on tropical islands was higher it also found that failure was correlated with factors amongst which include less pronounced seasonality, the presence of coconut, and the presence of crab communities, terrestrial crab communities. However, the review could not give us any definitive answers on why recent projects that had been implemented to a high standard and what was considered at the time to be best practice had failed. In the paper that I'll discuss today, we wanted to go deeper. We wanted to look at a collection of projects, dissect them um, carefully, and uh, try and figure out what, what uh, factors were responsible for those failures. And I shouldn't raise your hopes here because, by saying we succeeded, because we didn't. We didn't uh, answer the questions that we had, and we, like most, uh, science inquiries, we raised more questions than provided answers. But that's why tropical islands are, are the place to be. Um, we selected projects for this exercise based on the criteria presented here. 
We selected projects where bait had been applied by helicopter because these projects had, had the best record of success. Projects had to be well documented so we could dissect them in detail. They had to be on islands larger than 50 hectares because islands smaller than that uh, seemed to have an extraordinarily high success rate no matter what you did. Um, based on rainfall being a primary driver of productivity in tropical island systems, we only included islands that had a low uh, co uh, coefficient of variance for precipitation. Well, we use this as, the, as a proxy for low seasonality. The projects also had to have faced other challenges associated with tropical islands, such as the presence of terrestrial crabs and high natural food availability. And lastly, we wanted projects where we could rule out reinvasion as a factor. Where were the sites? I'll see if I can use this laser pointer. Uh, Frigate Island in the Seychelles, where Norway rats were successfully removed. Green dots are successful projects, red aren't. Uh, we have Wake Atoll here, where uh, Asian house rats were successfully removed from the atoll, but uh, Pacific rats survived. Uh, we have the Ringgold Islands here in Fiji, where Pacific rats were removed. We have Enderbury and Burnie here, uh, um, both targeted Pacific rats. Uh, Burnie, the smaller of the two islands, was successful. Uh, Palmyra successfully targeted ship rats. Henderson, uh, which you've heard a little bit about, an unsuccessful attempt to remove Pacific rats. And Destacheo Island, where ship rats were unsuccessfully targeted in 2011. I meant to say that uh, naturally when you're being so se selective, you rapidly cut yourself out of large sample sizes. And we ended up with, with these, uh, just these eight projects. Subsequent to our study, there have been other projects completed and it would be great to go back and include those in, in the analysis. We compared the projects. And that's going to do that. Uh, to see if we could tease out any differences. Uh, that would explain why four of them were unsuccessful. What did we learn? Well, frustratingly, as I say, we didn't get the definitive answers we were looking for, but we were able to rule out resistance and low bait toxicity as potential causal factors. That left us with two questions. One, bait availability. Did all rats have access to bait? Uh, bait palatability. Uh, did rats that have excess bait choose not to eat it? <clears throat> what can we say about the bait availability hypothesis? Well, based on the design of each of the projects encompassing overlapping bait swaths, as Keith uh, described earlier, comparatively higher application rates, a minimum of two applications, there was no doubt in our mind that each of those projects ensured comprehensive coverage of the island. Surely this should have ensured that every rat had access to bait. Well, there's one reason why that may not have been the case, and that is these guys. On tropical islands where rats breed all year round, Juveniles that are still in the nest are effectively isolated from our methods until they emerge. How long juveniles can remain isolated is obviously dependent on the lactating female. And how long she survives is, um, in, in most cases, she probably doesn't survive for very long. Uh, in some lab trials, uh, rats have survived for up to three weeks. And uh, we need to deal with out the outliers, especially in eradication projects. Was bait available to these juveniles when they emerged from the nest? Well, we cannot say with absolute certainty that that was the case. On Wake, Palmyra, Destacheo, bait disappeared very rap rapidly, thanks to terrestrial crabs. On Henderson, bait disappeared more slowly, but monitoring was undertaken in just one small corner of the island. And there was no monitoring undertaken on Enderbury and Burnie that could tell us how long bait uh, stuck around. 
Interestingly, though, young rats were seen later than one would have assumed possible on all of the islands where people were stationed after bait application. On Henderson, young rats were found two weeks after the first bait application. A young rat was found on Destichara three weeks after bait application. On Wake, a young rat was found at 18 days and another at 47 days. On Palmyra and Frigate, rats were found after bait application and subsequent treatments were undertaken. Interestingly, the, the, on Palmyra, it was a young rat that was found 36 days after the first application. And that rat uh, almost certainly had just emerged from a nest where the female had died. I'll let you ponder that, that question as I move to the next, the last of our hypotheses. Did some rats that had access to bait simply ignore it? And evidence for this scenario was conflicting, but we caught, of course can't rule it out. Plentiful natural food was available on all of the islands, all eight islands. Um, at the time of the eradication, but three of the unsuccessful projects were very unlucky and during the implementation they faced uh, abnormally high productivity uh, um, in terms of the ecosystem. Rats on these islands may simply have ignored rodent bait in, favor for nat uh, uh, in preference for natural foods that were there in abundance. It should also be noted that this factor may have acted in concert with low bait availability on all or some of the islands where rats survived. And increased productivity, of course, also increases the number of rats on the island, the rate of breeding, and these factors potentially compound each other. Which brings me to the conclusion of this presentation. Although we were not able to answer the key questions we were hoping to, we perhaps have narrowed the field of inquiry. We should definitely be looking at ways in which we can improve bait palatability. It's a holy grail, but uh, we should certainly be investing resources in investigating that. And we need to get to the bottom of the surviving juvenile hypothesis. We need to acknowledge that ecosystem productivity will never be predictable in many of the tropical island systems that we work. And while we may get, be get better at forecasting unusual events, we need to have a method that will work when factors are not in our favour. Many tropical island rat eradications have been successful. And the success record that uh, Greg uh, put up earlier is not, it's not far off that in the tropics either. And um, I'm confident that we'll only improve, only improve that success rate as our current knowledge um, improves. Thanks to the Global Review, there's now a great set of eradication best practices for tropical islands, and we need to continu continue to challenge the thinking behind that and refine those methods. Following these guidelines, Island Conservation and Fish and Wildlife Service have been back to Destacheo and David Will will be talking about the successful removal of ship rats from Destacho. And the last thing I wanted to say was, uh, oh, RSPB have been doing some pioneering work on Henderson to improve, uh, to inform an, a, a second eradication attempt. And we need to get back to those, to the Hendersons, the Wakes, the Enderburys, uh, because we've got too much to lose if we don't. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> really important to see um, reviews of these operations. They all amount to experiments, and it's vitally important that we learn from them. Next up, we have Stefan Opel from RSPB's That's Centre that. for Conservation that Science. Is, that is not the presentation. Where, like, Stefan um, led the scientific work on Henderson Island in 2015. And um, his presentation is essentially about knowing your enemy, a very important principle in conservation biology.
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to follow Richard Griffiths, who um, conveniently set me up to basically glimpse over the first part of my talk. So we just heard that uh, tropical rat eradications are more challenging, and we have seen more failures on tropical than on temperate islands. And a key problem is that you have a lack of seasonality. So on temperate islands, we usually target rodents uh, at the end of winter when there's naturally less food available on tropical islands, we often don't have that seasonality in a predictable way. And another problem that we face on tropical islands is that there is comparatively little knowledge of rodent ecology on, on tropical islands, especially about their movements, about uh, basic demographic parameters such as their survival, and the temporal variation in all of these parameters. So to improve our chances of success of rodent eradications on tropical islands, we need to provide more critical information. For example, the movement range of rats is very important to ensure that each rat has access to sufficient bait or to traps in its minimum home range. And you can uh, envision that uh, if you see the home range of a rat as this blue polygon, a small home range might mean that a rat doesn't have access to sufficient bait that you spread at a given density. So you really need to know how big the home ranges are on rats in different habitats on different islands to design your bait application rate or your, your trap density on an island to ensure that each rat has access to a lethal dose. The same goes for the temporal variation. So we don't have a typical seasonality on tropical islands as we see on, on temperate islands. But if you time your eradication efforts to coincide with naturally high mortality, which do occur on tropical islands as well as response to droughts or other events, um, then you have a higher probability of success. So we need to figure out when those natural events of higher mortality actually occur on, on tropical islands. So we wanted to provide some uh, information for the tropical uh, rodent um, or tropical island rodent community based on the, the failed eradication on Henderson. And uh, Mike Brook gave a quick overview of Henderson yesterday. If you've missed it, it's a subtropical island in the South Pacific. It's 4,300 hectares. It's a flat coral atoll um, that has lots of uh, endemic petrels nesting that are affected by a single uh, invasive rodent species, the Pacific rat. And we tried to eradicate these rats in August 2011, but the eradication failed. And we know that the eradication failed because 60 to 80 rats out of uh, hundreds of thousands survived the er eradication. So uh, there was no reinvasion to Henderson Island. So in 2015, the RSV went back to Henderson to conduct a scientific expedition to uh, answer two key questions, namely, how large are the home ranges of Pacific rats on Henderson, and did every rat actually have a chance to encounter a bait given the, uh, the application rate of the 2011 eradication? And is there any temporal variation in their survival that we could use to inform the a second operation and make the operation coincide with a natural um, peak in, in mortality? So to study uh, the movements and the survival of rats on Henderson, we established a, a life trapping array in two habitats, the two key habitats on Henderson Island. One is um, sort of a, a coconut grove that fringes the, the three beaches on Henderson. So this map shows you the, the beach back trapping grid, which was right along the beach in a coconut grove. And the plateau is sort of the rest of the island is a, is a flat rocky scrub that is uh, very impenetrable and five meters tall and it covers pretty much the the interior of the island and we set up uh, a trail network that extended about one and a half kilometers from the beach into the island and set up a life trapping array along this uh, trail network we captured and individually marked 810 rats over seven primary trapping sessions um, between june and october 2015 each primary session had about 10 trap nights each, and so we, we marked and released the rats to uh, figure out their movements and their survival. 
we calculated the, the minimum movement distances and the proportion of those rats that were only ever caught in a single trap, so where there, there was no movement evident at all, because that's quite important for, for an eradication. To estimate the survival and the home range of rats, we used a spatially explicit Cormac Jolly Zebra model, um, which accounts for the detection probability at each trap. And so it uh, overcomes the problem that you might have rats emigrating from your trapping array and factors that into your estimate of survival probability. Um, we lay out the movement and the survival parameters to vary over time because we're mostly interested in, in temporal variation of survival and movement. And we estimate the home range area based on the movement parameter sigma from those models, uh, assuming that rats have a circular home range, which may not be uh, necessarily the case, but is a good enough approximation. And then we calculated for these uh, estimated home range areas how many toxic bait pellets would have been in each rat's home range based on the uh, bait application rate that we used in the 2011 eradication. So in terms of movements, of the 810 rats that we marked, 580 were captured at least twice, so we can actually calculate how far they moved. And we found uh, quite a significant difference in the movement distances between the two habitats in the beach back and on the plateau. So rats on the plateau, which is a, a, a very dry environment with much less nutrients than the beach back coconut grove, moved on average much longer distances. This table shows you the mean distance between two subsequent capture events. And it was about 20 meters for males and females in the beach back and it was uh, between 40 to 50 meters for rats on the plateau. And the extremes were much, much higher on the plateau where some rats moved up to a kilometer between two subsequent capture events on subsequent nights. You will also see that the minimum in each habitat was zero. And in fact, 8.4% of, of the rats that were recaptured at least once were only ever caught at a single location, so no movement. And that, of course, is bad to encounter any bait. But all rats that were captured more than five times moved at least between two different trap locations, except one lactating female, which was caught nine times over the course of one month in only a single trap location. And that single lactating female and her pups is, of course, enough to to ruin an eradication. In terms of home range sizes, we found a difference not only between habitats, but also over time. So the mean home range radius increased uh, in late July and early August. There is a figure missing, but uh, anyway, it was a graph that showed you that uh, there is um, a slight increase in the, in the home range area in, in July and August. Uh, compared to the previous trapping sessions. We found a minimum home range that was 2.85 hectares on the plateau, so almost three times as big as in the beachback habitat. And if we use the, the bait application rates in, from, from 2011, we could figure out that even the smallest home ranges would have had more than 10,000 bait pellets in them during the 2011 eradication. So it's relatively unlikely that the rats didn't have access to a sufficient dose of toxic bait. In terms of survival, we found a distinct drop in survival probability uh, again in late July and early August. So this graph shows you the monthly survival probabilities between the seven uh, primary trapping sessions. And you can see a big drop in survival uh, in late July and early August. Um, but what you will also notice is that this reduction in survival is uh, surrounded by an enormous uh, uncertainty in the estimates. So very large confidence intervals. And these are a consequence of the larger movements. So um, this red line adds the um, home range uh, radius. Uh, as a proportion, so one is the largest home range radius that we recorded. And you see that the highest uncertainty 
in the survival parameter coincides with the greatest movement of the rats, which makes sense because at that time when the rats are moving very large distances, you, uh, the, um, you cannot distinguish whether rats die or whether they just left your trapping array, regardless of how large the trapping array is. So um, at the time where we had the largest movements, we had very low survival, but it was poorly, or it had very poor precision. So what we learned from that is that we found very distinct seasonal events that led to lower survival and larger movements in late July and August. We don't know exactly what caused these uh, events, whether it was some kind of food shortage, uh, and we also don't know whether these seasonal events occur regularly every year, but if they do, then uh, the best timing for future eradication would be somewhere around early August when there seems to be a natural uh, dip in, in survival probability anyway. The movements that we found were somewhat larger than we expected and it's quite unlikely that rats did not encounter any bait, but that is based on the average movement distances and we all know that uh, eradications have to consider the extremes. And the caveat is that we didn't record any movement for 8.4% of the recaptured rats, and we know that less than 0.2% survived the eradication in 2011, and detecting uh, anything that affects such a small proportion of the population with a sampling approach will always be very, very challenging. So we can't exclude that there may have been one or two lactating females that simply didn't venture out for a month and didn't encounter any bait. Um, but yeah, hopefully, if anybody has any suggestions what we could do better on Henderson uh, the next time around, please find me during that conference. And with that, I'd like to thank everybody who was involved in that expedition and raised funds for it. And that's it. Stephen, immaculate timing. Sadly, the last um, talk in this session from Megan Sear from the North Carolina State University, um, a glimpse at some exciting new tools for the future. <clears throat> Thanks. All right. Um, so I would just like to first start off and point out um, that I will be presenting just on a very, very small sliver of a much larger project um, that uh, Greg Howell had mentioned earlier called the G-Bird Project. So what you can see here is um, lots of different partnerships, um, NC State being just one of those partnerships. And given that I'm just a PhD student, um, I'm just a little tiny sliver of this much larger but really exciting project that I'd like to talk to you about. So a brief little overview. I don't need much of a talk now at this point to talk to you about invasive house mice on islands, um, but just some brief rundowns. Um, genetic manipulation of sex ratios. So I'll be talking about one of the genetic techniques that could potentially be used. Reproductive competitiveness in our standard laboratory cages. And then reproductive competitiveness in our larger enclosures, which we affectionately call our arenas. So again, it goes without explaining why mice on islands. Um, you've been um, already listening um, to the fact that due to human colonization, um, mus musculus are found globally, with again, over 80% of islands having invasive rodents, and many of you have probably seen this threatened island biodiversity database. Uh, this one I just pulled up a little bit before the conference, um, showing to you those red where we have specifically mus. As you know, the traditional method for rodent eradications is toxicants. Um, there has been noted at times higher failure rates for mice, um, though again, when done properly, as we were listening to earlier in the session, um, it can be achieved. Um, when talking about aerial broadcasts, again, cannot be used on inhabited islands. And of course, um, one of the things that we've talked about or has been kind of mentioned is these off-target effects in this. Indeed, there are animal welfare concerns. I would like to point out that obviously there has been success on a lot of un uninhabited smaller islands, but as we scale up and as we look to the future, questions arise about is there potentially other 
new on the horizon techniques. So the technique that I'm going to talk to you about today is a gene drive technique. Um, we call it the SRY technique, and to learn all the full details about it, I would recommend that you go see Donna Kennedy's poster later on this evening. In this case, what you are thinking about, what we are thinking about doing, is creating a sex bias in the population. So if you could bias the population to be all one sex. In this case, the SRY technique is looking to be heavily male biased. So the SRY gene is the male determining gene or testes determining factor, and that's all that's necessary and sufficient to start the cascade of male hormones so that male development occurs. If you were to take just that SRY gene that's located normally on the Y chromosome and to put it on a non-sex chromosome, an autosome, then even XX mice, females, would be phenotypically male. They would look like a male, they would mate like a male, but they would be sterile. So you would have your normal males, your SRY males, because they are normally caring. You have your SRY male here, but a case, again, that's XX, so they would be sterile. So we know that if you were to take the SRY gene, you could make males. But that would just be one time in a laboratory, and now you have some males. So now you actually need a mechanism that could potentially drive it or get it into the population. And that's where this particular gene drive occurs. There's many different types of gene drives. The one that's on everyone's mind and they can't even get it out of their head these days is CRISPR. Um, but this is a different type of gene drive. This is called the T haplotype or the T complex. It's actually naturally occurring in mice. It's found on chromosome 17. It has a group of inversions here. And what this gene drive does is it impacts sperm motility. So, if mice carry the gene drive, then they will be normal swimming, this T haplotype. For those of them that don't carry it, they're going to be impaired. Essentially, these have something that they lay down that impact the swimming of the ones that don't carry it. And this gene drive is incredibly efficient. So far, we're seeing rates of 95%. So in other words, 95% of the offspring will carry this gene drive. Now, again, other collaborators at Texas A&M are working at looking into getting the SRY gene into this T haplotype. But what I've been looking at is mostly the reproduction and the mate choice aspects here. So we have a mechanism that could drive, and we have this way with the SRY to make them male, but then well, these are laboratory mice. And when I first heard about this project, my very first thought was someone along the line said, well, you know, we'll get some lab mice and we'll get some wild mice and it'll be done. And I was like, um, my background's mostly in animal behavior. And for any of you who have encountered a wild mouse versus a lab mouse, they're nothing alike in many, many aspects. So in this case, um, the first thing that I was interested in was actually getting the different mice to mate. So at North Carolina State University, we have wild-derived island mice from the Farallon Islands. So that was pointed out earlier. This is a group of islands off the coast of San Francisco, California. Um, and these islands have some of the highest mouse densities ever recorded with non-commensal habitats, particularly on islands. They don't have any plans for a gene drive by any means. Um, they are still hoping for eradication, but if you saw earlier in Greg Howell's talk, um, there's definitely been some conversations in San Francisco, California, um, about animal welfare concerns um, regards to rodenticide. Um, but that is their current method. So we have mice that are wild-derived, sorry, taken from the Farallon Islands. We have mice that carry the T haplotype. So I just want to be clear with you that they're not completely there with the gene drive aspect. They have the gene drive, but they don't have the male gene. So they're just the naturally occurring gene drive that is present. This version is called the TW2. And so we have mice that are on a standard laboratory background of B6129 that carry this gene drive. And then the first thing that I wanted to do was, well, what again, what happens if you put them in a shoebox together um, and do they mate? So if we take a wild female, and mate her with one of these laboratory males, we get our F1 hybrids. So these are crossed again with Farallon versus TW2. And these mice are again our 50% wild background. And then to even generate further, we can do a back cross where we take one of these males, 
made it to one of the Farallon females, and get a 75% wild back cross. So indeed, they will mate, and they will mate in these standard laboratory cages, but then reproductively, how do they compare? What are their litter sizes? What are their pups? Those kinds of questions I've also been exploring. <coughs> So just to go back a little bit as far as that T haplotype, what I'm screening for is this base pair insertion that you'll see here. So this is a normal wild type mouse. This is one of our Farallon mice. You'll see the presence of just a single band. Mice that carry the gene drive in our case are heterozygotes here, so they have one normal copy. They have one copy here. And so that's just making sure that the gene drive is indeed bidding passed down in our populations when we mate the wild mice with the laboratory T-carrying haplotype. You'll notice I don't have any of the homozygote TW2s here. That's because they are sterile. In many T haplotypes, it is lethality. But in this case, this version that I keep calling the TW2, what you get is just that they are sterile. So, so far, I have 115, 117 of my hybrids confirmed. And in this case, I have a 98% transmission of the gene drive. So when I mate my wild-derived females with my laboratory males in the cages, again, I can look at things like pup size, I can look at weights, um, but really, even though I know they mate in laboratory cages, that doesn't mean anything if it comes out to the wild. And if you really wanted to try and eventually scale this up onto a small island, you need to know, can those TW2 strain males reproduce successfully? So can they successfully mate if they're in competition with other wild-derived males or other males on this island? And if not, what degree of that back crossing would be required? Could you use just any laboratory mouse? Will they really just survive on an island? Would they need to be 50% wild, 75% wild, et cetera? So, so far, preliminary results have indicated that back-crossed litter sizes are comparable to purely wild-derived litters. So if I look at my Farallons, and I look at litter size compared to my F1s and my F2s, I see that they are comparable. So in other words, litter size is the same. That's good if we wanted to release a mouse with a gene drive on the island, we would definitely want them to have the same litter size, um, if not even be more, right, so that we could get this into the population. I also have seen that hybrid pups are significantly larger than their Farallon pups at weaning. I'd also like to point that this trend continues, that they are larger in general. However, um, that is not quite significant. So these hybrid pups are significantly larger at weaning. They grow faster. They grow larger. And again, they maintain that size. Other thing I'd like to point out to you, again, is that while this is all in standard, laboratory cages, what happens if that female is actually given a choice? So this is our reproductive competitiveness in our large enclosures, again, that we call our arenas. These arenas are about eight foot by four foot. Yes, I'm American, about three meters squared all around, okay? And you have two mice that are put in there that are the wild type. So these are the Farallon ones. And then we're giving them one of the Farallon males and then one of the laboratory or the laboratory background males. So the first case, I have five trials where I had the females with the male, with the TW2 male, and I didn't see any transmission. So those males were not able to transmit. They were not able to pass that down. They were not the fathers. However, in eight trials where I have the females with that male, but with a hybrid 50% wild male, I have 70% TW2 transmission, indicating they actually might be stronger competitors than their, than their wild counterparts. One thing is it's all good to know who the father is, but I also want to know what they're doing when we walk away. And so we have a new system where we've been tracking animal movements using, ra using radio frequency identification. Here we can see what time is spent, what they're spending it with, and again, who they're spending it with as well. So in summary, eradication of rodents for conservation has made major contributions. Um, but maybe perhaps it is time. It's reaching its limits, or we need to think beyond the box. Um, a novel approach using the SRYT haplotype gene drive is a potential technology. Of course, there is high uncertainty. There's lots of questions, but I think it's worth exploring. 
And the, again, the first step is mating between island wild derived mice and lab strains carrying the T haplotype in these semi natural environments. And I have lots of people to thank, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry that we haven't had time for questions, um, but thank you to all our speakers. Uh, all of this, these brief presentations represent a hell of a lot of work, um, and it's, it's genuinely impressive. Thank you very much indeed.